Okay, so like I said the other day, I'm going to continue with this lecture and then, or from Wednesday's lecture, and then I'm going to get into sugar derivatives. And sugar derivatives are really just molecules that, well, they have a kind of sugar, like the foundational molecule that we've talked about, <clears throat> and then a little bit more added to it. So with that in mind, So these are our um, aldoses, important aldoses that we talked about. Now, like I said, there's a total of five of them. I, I want you to know the structures of glyceraldehyde. Then I want you to know ribose, glucose, mannose, and galactose. It's important that you know how these sugars can be changed and make a different version of them. For example, if I displayed the structure of D-glyceraldehyde, could you identify the structure of L-glyceraldehyde? That's pretty simple and straightforward. That's just switching the one chiral carbon. But if I were to ask you to identify the structure of L-glucose, that's a little bit more complicated. You've got to remember that that is a total mirror image. In addition to that, we talked about a lot of terminology last class period. We talked about enantiomers, diastereomers, epimers. What makes something an epimer, but not a diastereomer? What makes something an enantiomer, but not an epimer? So distinguishing between those. Now, the next group of molecules that we're going to talk about are ketoses. And there's a total of three ketoses that I want you to know the structures of. Dihydroxyacetone, ribulose, and fructose. Fructose arguably is kind of simple because it's basically the structure of glucose. The only difference is that we have a ketone functional group instead of an aldose or instead of an aldehyde. So carbon number two is your uh, carbonyl carbon. Okay, so there's fructose, ribose, rib or, sorry, fructose, ribulose, and dihydroxyacetone. All of these have a ketone. Carbon number two is where your uh, Carbonyl carbon is everything else. Well, it's OH, either on the right or left-hand side of the structure. Now, the way that I always remember glucose, and that's my foundational sugar that I remember, as I look at it, I say, okay, it's got, or it is a hexose. So it's got six carbons. If I'm drawing D-glucose, I'm going to put my hydroxide on the right-hand side of carbon number five. It is also an aldose. So I can have this right here, okay? So this right now is an aldehyde. It's a D sugar and it's a hexose. So this is an aldo or a D aldo hexose. Now that means, one, two, three, yep. Yeah. No, I, I could, sorry about that, I miscounted. But I can fix that very easily because I haven't drawn anything consequential. And that would be three, four. <clears throat> okay, so carbons two, three, four. Those are the carbons that I really care about. And whenever I'm drawing glucose, I remember right, left, right. That's where I put my hydroxide groups. Right, left, right. Right, left, right. That is the way that I remember the structure of glucose. After that, that gives me the way to go ahead and draw, let's say, the, the C3 epimer of glucose. So the C3 epimer of glucose is taking that hydroxide group that was on the left-hand side and drawing it on the right-hand side of my structure. That is the C3 epimer of glucose. So that's another thing that I'm expecting you to be able to do, identify a C3 epimer of glucose or identify epimers of different sugars. Okay, so there is glucose. There are my ketoses that I want you to know the structures of and be able to identify and be able to change them. If I asked you for the structure of L-ribulose, would you be able to pick that out? If I asked you for the structure of L-xylulose, would you be able to pick that out? And uh, other sugar. Well, actually, I wouldn't expect D-xylulose, but L, or not L-xylulose, but L-ribulose, 
because I'm asking you to know the structure of D ribulose. Okay, now the cyclization of sugars is an important part of this class. In order for a sugar to cyclize, you have to have a carbonyl carbon with a partial positive charge. Well, aldehydes and ketones both have that partial positive charge. That's going to react with a partial negative charge on an alcohol. So an aldehyde can react with an alcohol to form what's known as a hemiacetal. A ketone can react with an alcohol to form a hemiketal. That hemiacetal can then react with another alcohol to form an acetal. Now this right here, this hemiacetal or this hemiketal is what's formed whenever we have the cyclization of a sugar. An acetal and a ketal is whenever we have an, a hemiacetal react with an alcohol. So that's in the continuation of sugars, of, of making a polysaccharide or a disaccharide, which we'll get to in the latter half of this lecture. Now, we have two major types of sugars that form. We have the cyclic pyran ring, and we have a cyclic furan ring. This makes pyranoses or furanoses. Those are the two major structures that form when we have the cyclization of a sugar. Now, anomeric carbons, those are our new chiral centers that result from the cyclization. Monosaccharides exist almost entirely as five and six membered rings. As we talked about last time, anything smaller than a five membered ring or larger than a six membered ring is really going to run into some problems. It's not going to be as favorable structurally. The anomeric carbon is our new stereocenter that results. Here is that anomeric carbon in the cyclization of glucose. So here's our linear glucose. This is carbon number one. Carbon number one becomes the anomeric carbon. Here again is carbon number one. Now we have two forms of sugars that can result because we have a hydroxide group that can be either pointing down, as is evidenced by this one that I drew right here. So this is down, or it's going to be pointing up, as is the case with this hydroxide group here. Now, these two sugars, if the sugar, if the hydroxide group is pointing down, that is considered an alpha variation or an alpha anomer. If the hydroxide group is pointing up, it's considered a beta anomer. The alpha and beta forms of a sugar are alpha and beta anomers. These are also known as an anomeric pair. The two anomers can interconvert freely in a process known as mutorotation. So the interconversion from the alpha to the beta form, the beta to the alpha form, that's going to undergo some, or that's referred to as mutorotation. Now, biologically, about 66% of these sugars end up in the beta configuration, and that beta configuration is arguably the more stable form of it. Here's a gradual depiction of basically what's happening whenever we're cyclizing a sugar. This is glucose cyclizing to form the beta configuration of cyclic glucose. Now, we go ahead and we basically build our name up. So glucose kind of refers to that linear form of our sugar. Well, we have a six-membered ring. Five of those members are carbons. The sixth is an oxygen. This is a pyranose. Because if you remember, a pyran ring is a six-membered ring d glucopyranose alpha d glucopyranose beta d glucopyranose those are the two forms of the sugar so here we have that cyclization event taking place now this is what basically it looks like when we have something like fructose the ketose form of glucose forming its two potential outputs 
Here we have a Furanos ring. A five-membered ring. One of those members is an oxygen. Carbon number, or this carbon right here reacts with this hydroxide group. So this oxygen in that hydroxide group is the oxygen within our ring. This oxygen right here becomes a hydroxyl group. And if that group is pointing downward, then we're talking about an alpha form of our sugar. If that hydroxide group is pointing and if it's pointing downward and instead we form a six-membered ring, well, then we have alpha d fructopyranose. So this brings up a great question, I think. Can a six-carbon ketose form a six-membered ring? And the answer is yes, it can. Well, how does it do it? The way that it does it is by reacting with the hydroxide group on carbon number six. So this carbon reacts with this hydroxide group to form a six-membered ring. It reacts with this hydroxide group to form a five-membered ring. So sugars can form five or six-membered rings. It really just depends on what's going to be more stable. Now, the structure of the convention whenever we're drawing a sugar, a cyclic sugar is known as a Hayworth structure. I always draw Hayworth structures like this, two horizontal and parallel lines, then one triangle. Then I put my oxygen and another triangle. There's my six-membered ring. Now, if you remember, one of the things that I talked about previously was I referred to glucose as being right, left, right. Okay, now what we need to do is think about carbon number six is pointing upwards. If that was pointing downwards into the ring, there'd be a lot of steric strain or torsional strain. In addition to that, that would be an unsafe, un, sorry, that would be an unstable structure. In addition to that, by pointing upward, we're talking about the D form of our sugar. Okay, so this is carbon six. This is five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, now four, that hydroxide group is going to be pointing downward. Three, the hydroxide group is going to be pointing upward. Two, it's going to be pointing downward. So whenever I talk about drawing linear glucose, linear, I say right, left, right four carbons, two, three, and four. Now cyclic, well, cyclic glucose, I'm talking about down, up, down. Carbons two, three, and four are down, up, and down. Now carbon number one, that is not going to, if that's pointing up or if that's pointing down, that's not going to designate glucose or non-glucose, but instead that's going to be influencing, are we talking about alpha or beta glucose? When that hydroxide group is pointing downward, we're talking about alpha, the alpha form of glucopyranose. When it's pointing upward, we're talking about the beta form of glucopyranose. So these two sugars are anomers, and that's pretty much the, the high points of that that study. Now we're going to switch over and we're going to talk about, as soon as I get this in the full screen, we're going to talk about sugar derivatives. Now sugar derivatives and understanding sugar derivatives, this is a very important point because it's going to be helpful for understanding larger molecules, taking a single saccharide and making a polysaccharide. Okay. Now, common furanoses, common five member rings, are fructofuranose and ribofuranose. Fructose and ribose commonly form furanoses. Now, I bring these up because this one right here, if you've taken a cell biology or any biology class, this is one that you're actually a little bit familiar with. You might also be familiar with deoxy ribose. Furanose. 
but you probably didn't call it deoxyribofurinose. You probably just called it deoxyribose. Yeah, because one of these hydroxide groups was missing to make deoxyribose, also known as the sugar in DNA. Now, when it comes to what does a cyclic form of glucose actually look like? Well, in reality, it's not going to look like this wonderful Hayworth projection. Because the different atoms are not going to take up that much space and they're not going to be that far from one another. And then I can take on those bond angles. The Hayworth structure is a nice depiction of it. It's a nice model. But in terms of what does it actually look like? What does glucose actually look like? More than likely, it's going to take on the chair or boat configuration or conformation that you're a little bit familiar with from organic. For our purposes, I'm always going to show Hayworth projections as like, this is what you need to know. I'll bring back the chair and boat conformations from time to time, but my focus is really going to be on those Hayworth configurations or those Hayworth projections. Now, let's go ahead. Okay, so there we go. Here's our cyclic form. This right here is good. That's what I think is best to practice with. This right here, I think is one of the toughest ones, just because not difficult, like challenging, but one of the problems that I've seen people run into is they struggle to draw bond angles correctly. And so they end up with a structure that's, it's kind of a hybrid of this and this right here. So they end up with something that looks a little bit like this. That's one, two, three, four, five, six. So it has six members, but the angle is off and then it just, it does not look good. So if you're drawing a cyclic form of a sugar, draw the Hayworth projections. And this is, you're not going to have to draw anything on an exam or anything like that, but just as extra practice, draw those Hayworth projections. Now, functional groups on sugars. When we look at a cyclic form of a sugar, which as we proceeded on, we've emphasized more of the D sugars. Why is that? Because D sugars are much more biologically relevant. L sugars are largely irrelevant biologically. We focused on the D sugars. What functional groups do you see on any one of these D sugars? Hydroxide groups, alcohols. You see these hydroxide groups. These groups can be reduced. And in the case of glucose, for example, when glucose is reduced, that aldehyde can be reduced to form a molecule known as sorbitol. Sorbitol is produced naturally from glucose. It can be used as a sugar substitute because it's metabolized very slowly. So it's, it's an artificial sweetener. However, natural production due to elevated levels of glucose in the purpose, in the case of somebody afflicted with diabetes, um, it can contribute to cataract formation and nerve damage. It's neuropathy is an example. Uh, the diabetic neuropathy is that, that nerve damage that can occur. Now, here what we have is ribose. I mentioned ribofurinose. We were looking, that at a, or looking at that a moment ago. Here we can also have something known as 2-deoxyribose. At carbon number two, we have removed this hydroxide group and replaced it with a hydrogen. So deoxyribose. Now, reduction of ribose, uh, reduction of ribose component of nucleotides is a critical step in the synthesis of deoxynucleotides needed for DNA synthesis. So if this reduction reaction right here is absolutely pivotal for existence, for the cell cycle. If that's delayed, then you can't make DNA. Then your genome is going to be compromised. You're really going to run into some problems. Now, one of these sugar alcohols that we mentioned a little bit ago, known as sorbitol, also known as glucotol, there's another artificial sweetener known as sucralose. Now, one of the things that I want you to notice about this is this is a two-ringed structure. This is a disaccharide. It's a disaccharide, but there's one thing that stands out, chlorine. This is a chlorinated disaccharide. 
Now, I don't expect you to know this name or anything like that, but in the coming slides, these are things that I do want you to know. Sucralo or sucrose, lactose, and maltose are all examples of disaccharides. Glucose and fructose come together to make sucrose. Glucose and galactose come together to make lactose. Maltose is a combination of uh, two glucose molecules. Now, when you look at this, one thing that stands out to me is this right here. Fructose is the ketose form of glucose. Galactose is the C4 epimer of glucose. Now, this is our depiction of sucrose. Now, if you look at sucrose's structure, we've got glucose on the left, fructose on the right. We have carbon number one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if we look at our fructose, what we have is carbon number One, two, three, four, five, six. Which is, yeah, there we go. Now, this bond is super important. This is known as a glycosidic linkage or a glycosidic bond. This is the bond between carbons number one and two in this particular case. Now, we have a designation for this where we would say this is a disaccharide made up of alpha D glucopyranosyl 1, 2, beta D fructofuranoside. So, a disaccharide is also known as a glycoside. Now, if we wanted to put this together in a more appropriate like space filling model. It's like what we see on the right hand side. There's our carbons for glucose numbered and there's our carbons for fructose numbered. Now disaccharides like lactose and maltose are going to look like this. If you remember, lactose is a combination of galactose and glucose. Now, one of the things that I want you to recognize about these two different sugars is always what we're going to do is we're going to point out where the oxygen within our ring is. Okay, so it's right there, right there. Our carbon number, one and one. Now, when you think about the cyclization of an aldose, an aldohexose, we'll say, which carbon is the anomeric carbon? Carbon one. So carbon one is the anomeric carbon. So that's going to be our alpha or beta designation. Now, this group right here, that functional group right there is known as a hemiacetal. This entire group right here is known as an acetal. If you remember, an acetal forms between a hemiacetal and an alcohol. Okay, so a hemiacetal and an alcohol. So if I show you a sugar that has a free hemiacetal, as is the case with lactose, this is an example of what's known as a reducing sugar. Now, if we look over at maltose, maltose has that group. The bond angle is different, but this is also an acetal. What about this right here? That's a Joe Dirt's favorite uh, functional group. That's a hemi, a hemiacetal. 
So lactose is an example of reducing sugar. Maltose is also an example of reducing sugar. Maltose is the sugar between two um, glucose molecules, and lactose is galactose and glucose. These are both reducing sugars. Now, they both have glycosidic linkages between carbon number one and carbon number four. When we have any one of those free anomeric carbons where we have a hemiacetal present, that is considered a reducing sugar, like what we saw with lactose. An exception to that, or a non-reducing sugar, I'm sorry, would be where your anomeric carbons are both involved in the formation of your glycosidic linkage. So your anomeric carbons, in this case, are both bound. So sucrose is an example of a non-reducing sugar. So one way to think about this is every single monosaccharide in its linear or its cyclic form is a reducing sugar. Okay, so every monosaccharide is a reducing sugar. Not every disaccharide is a reducing sugar, only if it has a hemiacetal or a hemiketal. How's it going to have a hemiacetal or a hemiketal? Well, by having a free anomeric carbon. And whenever you think like, what is what is a, a good way to identify a free anomeric carbon? Well, by seeing an anomeric carbon bound to a hydroxyl group and nothing else. All right, so that's a good place to be with respect to disaccharides, understanding what a reducing sugar and a non-reducing sugar is. Now, the next slide, we've seen this before. We've talked about glycolysis. We talked about this in the terms of energy and the energetics of glycolysis. We've looked at the sugars, and here we're going to revisit them. The reason that we're going to revisit them is because now we have a little bit more familiarity. For instance, we've seen glucose. Here is a good form of glucose. Now, my first question is, is this the alpha or the beta designation of glucose? Well, by that hydroxide group pointing downward, we're talking about an alpha hydroxide group or an alpha uh, form of an alpha anomer. Then we have in our second step, we have a, an example of a phosphorylation event where our sugar has been phosphorylated. A phosphate group has been added to carbon number six. So when I look at these two sugars, there's a lot of questions that I think are, are good to ask. One is, what is this? Well, it's an aldose. It's a hexose. Does it have an anomeric carbon? Yes, it does. Is it the alpha or the beta designation? Oh, it's the alpha form. Glucose 6-phosphate. Well, we've got a phosphate on carbon number six. Is that indicating a um, is that indicating that we have a phosphorylated form? Yes, it is. We've got a phosphate group on carbon number six. Now, if we look at our next structure, we have fructose six phosphate. Well, it's fructose. And what are some terms that we can throw around for this? It's a furanose. It's a phosphorylated furanose. So that means it's a five-membered ring with one carbon. It's a ketose, or sorry, not with one carbon, I mean one oxygen in the ring. It's a ketose. Then when we get down here, we're gonna go through a couple more steps. I like this right here, GAP and DHAP. GAP is glyceraldehyde, Phosphate. And DHAP is dihydroxy acetone phosphate. So that's a molecule that's found. And both of these are three carbon molecules. What's the difference between? glyceraldehyde and dihydroxyacetone. 
Well, glyceraldehyde is an aldose. Dihydroxyacetone is a ketose. That's a big difference between us. Now, we are very deliberately getting into glycolysis. And the reason for that is because what people have a tendency to do is they just burn through this. They get their index cards and, you know, they memorize it. But in the process, they're neglecting to really think about important parts of it. And they're losing their ability to problem solve. So here what we're doing is we've just been introduced to different forms of sugars. Aldoses and ketoses, looked at those. And here we're seeing where those aldoses and ketoses are. For the first two steps right up here, the first two structures are both aldoses. The next two structures are ketoses. Then you get an aldose and a ketose. So that's where I'm going to stop on during our next lecture meeting, we're going to be talking about glycolysis and we're going to be going through the steps in, a, again, a little bit more of a deliberate fashion where we'll look at all the structures and everything like that. I hope this was helpful and I hope you have a good one.